Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to our final webinar of 2020. I'm Angie Crush. I'm a partner here at Thomas Mansfield. And today I'm joined by my colleagues, Jonathan Mansfield, Meredith Hurst Hi. and Julie Goodway. Hi. Um, now, I'll start off by apologising because we had some fairly major technical issues yesterday in trying to put next year's webinar list um, up on the website and live. Uh, somehow it managed to wipe off the entire sort of registration for today's webinar. So apologies that you've had to go on and register in for today's webinar. Um, if any of you, like we can see that um, we know that there were sort of several people from one company registered and now there's only one, for example. So if any of your colleagues that you know were planning on attending um, are having trouble getting on, I've put in the chat box um, at the, at the uh, side of the screen um, the details, the sort of link through that you could always forward to any colleagues so that they can sort of quickly re-register uh, and jump onto this webinar now. Um, so hopefully that will will help anyone that you know was hoping to watch and um what i'm going to do just while we're killing a little bit of time just literally a couple of minutes um so that anyone who's only just realizing they can't get on so that they've got time to re-register um i'm going to do a couple of not so serious polls just to um make sure everyone's awake and listening this morning and um, now this one's been a, a debate in in my house and between my colleagues so i'm going to start this poll now is die hard a christmas movie um, we can't agree enough. so you know we i'm just going to put it out there for the vote um, if you go to your polls button um on the screen hopefully you'll be able to to give us your vote so that we can settle this decision once and for all Oh my, there's a no come up. I mean, I was on the yes camp. So um, so at the moment it's, oh, okay, right. We've got some yes people coming in. Or oh, still mainly no. One person's, what is a diehard? You've got to watch the film. And, and we've got someone saying, what has this got to do with employment law? And you're quite right. But we'll be boring you enough with all the employment law updates throughout the, the rest of this webinar. I can assure you of that. Um, so I will end the poll there. We've got 30% say yes, 50% say no, 13% just says what are you talking about, and 4% uh, and with what's it got to do with employment law. So I'll end that poll there. Um, and then the next poll that I'm going to do um, is you'll, this will become apparent why this uh, is relevant to the webinar during the course of the webinar, because Meredith will be discussing one of the sort of interesting cases of this year. So the next poll is who is considering doing Veganuary, where you go vegan for the month of January? Is anyone? <laughs> no, 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 absolutely not. Um, let's see if anyone's uh, going to brave it and, and try to do Veganuary. I've got no and no, I think. Oh, yes, we've got no and no. Let's say that the top one is yes, although that doesn't really work because some people may have already answered that. No, but maybe. Well, let's see if... Um, if during the course of the webinar, anyone changes their mind, having heard about the case. OK, so I'm going to end that poll there. So who are we? Thomas Mansfield is a specialist employment law firm, and we work with a wide range of employers. Um, often we work with HR managers direct. Um, and we also work with the sort of wider HR team, but also we work with business owners where they don't have a dedicated HR function. Now, this is a time of year where we often find ourselves advising on the typical Christmas party type issues. Notable ones from years gone by are the person who set fire to their boss when they were walking back to the table carrying a tray of Zambuca shots, uh, candles on the table, 
it didn't make for a good ending and uh, yet that all ended in tears. Um, there was also the person that broke the photocopier while photocopying their rear end. Um, and so the whole printer machine was broken. That took some explaining as well. Um, and sadly this year, when we're not likely to get any of these amusing tales um, as the traditional office parties out of the question. So hopefully we can be of service in another way today by bringing you a roundup of the key changes in employment law this year, which have gone a bit under the radar with everything else that's been happening. Now, we specifically aren't dealing with, with COVID in our, in our update today. Um, firstly, because we did a, a dedicated webinar on that earlier in the year, which you can watch the recording of. And secondly, because everyone's bored to tears of COVID and just wants some proper law to, to think about. So um, at the end of this, session we're try trying to make this session a bit more interactive so we've got an update but then what we want to do is throw the floor open you can ask us questions about any subject you like including covid if if that's what you're burning questions on so in the chat box please do put any questions that you've got and i will be trying to make sure that those questions get answered at some point during the webinar um, and hopefully that that means that, that you can get the answers to the questions that you want. Um, so, as I said, there's a chat box there. Put your questions in there. <clears throat> also, in the offers box, um, a free hours consultation that we're offering to any um, any new employer clients. Please take advantage of that offer or contact one of us after the webinar, and we'd be happy to sort of sort that out for the new year. So, moving forward, Jonathan. Now, this year, case law has been a bit thin on the ground because of the disruption to the court system. Um, but as always, discrimination law has thrown up some important cases. Which ones are you going to tell us about this morning? Well, one of the difficult areas in discrimination law is, of course, where you have two protected characteristics which kind of clash uh, with each other. And the, what, what an area where you tend to get a conflict in particular is what religion and belief and protected characteristics like sexual orientation. So the first case I'm going to mention is actually quite a well publicised one and it went to the Supreme Court at the end of 2018 but it's still a live issue because it's going to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Uh, this is the case in, involving the gay couple who ordered a cake from a bakery in Northern Ireland and asked for the slogan support gay marriage to be uh, to, to, to be uh, depicted on it, which was refused by the owner. It's actually a service provision case, but the principles in, of discrimination are, are still um, very relevant. It went all the way up to the Supreme Court, as I mentioned, and the decision was taken that this was actually not um, unlawful uh, discrimination. And um, just to give you uh, an idea of how the, the law is looking at this at the moment, Lady Hale, who, was the, who gave the judgment at the Supreme Court, tried to distinguish between uh, something which has to do with sexual orientation and something which is on the grounds of sexual orientation. So the argument uh, in this case was that if it wasn't because of the sexual orientation of the customer, uh, that the decision was was made, but the religious belief, the strongly held Christian convictions of this particular couple who didn't believe in gay marriage, that was the actual reason for the decision. And it was pointed out that had they uh, had had the the um, the, the gay customer uh, requested something without the slogan, they would have been served. Also, if a heterosexual um, couple had come along and asked for something with the slogan on it would have been refused also on, on the grounds of the belief so it wasn't sexual orientation itself which was the cause of the um, the issue in in this case in fact there was evidence and it of course these things are very fact specific as well there was evidence here that uh, the, the, they had served gay couples and even had gay members of staff working in the bakery so they didn't have a general um, discriminatory attitude towards um, people, um, uh, to, towards gay people. Contrast this with another case which came up um, this year, which is it's an employment tribunal uh, level, but I think it's an, it's an interesting one to show how the law will view 
these. And this is the case of, of Ma uh, Macareth and the uh, Department for Work and Pensions. He, uh, Dr. Macareth was um, a doctor um, who, who was working as a contractor for um, the DWP. Um, and he had an issue because of his strongly held Christian convictions. Uh, he didn't, be didn't believe um, in gender reassignment and, and, and uh, was not prepared to address patients by their chosen pronoun. This resulted in disciplinary proceedings and eventual dismissal. And the question came up, was this uh, discrimination on the grounds of this doctor's uh, religious beliefs? Well, the important um, principles were set out in a case called Granger and Nicholson a few years ago, which tried to deal with this the, the difficult balancing act you've got in cases like this. And it stated there that the belief to be protected must be worthy of respect in a democratic society, as well as not being incompatible with human dignity or in conflict with others' rights. So gender reassignment is a, a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. And the issue here was the conflict with another person's right. And it was held that, that there was therefore no uh, unlawful discrimination. Lack of belief in transgenderism and conscientious objection to transgenderism, in our judgment, are incompatible with human dignity and conflict with the fundamental rights of others, specifically here, transgender individuals. That's what was stated in the judgment. And so there was no unlawful discrimination in this case. Thanks for that, Jonathan. And Meredith, I believe you have another discrimination based case to discuss. Yes, someone's asked us to state the citations of the cases and uh, type the names in chat. It's not that easy when we're talking to do that, uh, but we can provide them afterwards if you like. I think that we probably need to get that out of the way. Um, so we can provide them. The cases I'm talking about are first instance decision tribunal and they are available on, on the internet um, anyway. Um, under the Equality Act, having a particular religious or philosophical belief can amount to a protected characteristic, as Jonathan has stated. Now, this means that if you treat a person less favourably for professing a particular faith or for holding a particular belief than someone who doesn't hold that belief, then they could have a claim of discrimination. And we normally associate claims arising in this area with religious beliefs, but other types of belief can be protected under the legislation, such as in this case, ethical veganism. You might ask, why is this important? Well, the message is not to assume that because someone isn't professing an overtly religious belief, that they won't be protected from less favourable treatment. So let's look at the facts of this case heard earlier this year. And this case is Costa, C-O-S-T-A, against League Against Cruel Sports. And it is available on the internet. During his employment, Mr Costa took a particular interest in the company's pension fund and concluded that it was unethically investing in companies which were said to harm animals. Now, he took steps to have his contributions diverted to an alternative fund, which he deemed was more ethical. Mr. Costa is an ethical uh, vegan. Now, he also informed his work colleagues about the company's pension funds via several emails, telling them what he'd done and effectively advising them to do the same. Now, his employer, the League Against Cruel Sports, dismissed him for gross misconduct, I think for quite an odd reason, in a sense, for giving financial advice to his colleagues. I suspect that they were probably fed up with him evangelising about his ethical veganism. But anyway, he brought a claim alleging that the dismissal was an act of discrimination. Now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission Code of Practice on Employment sets out the requirements for a philosophical belief. It must be genuinely held. It must be more than a mere opinion or viewpoint. It must be a belief about a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. And importantly, it must be worthy of respect in a democratic society and not conflict with the fundamental rights of others. And that goes back to the, the gay, um, uh, gay, gay cake case. Now, the tribunal will need to consider whether the individual adheres to the belief, so they don't just hold the belief, they have to live the life of, of the belief, 
and that the adherence is more than merely the assertion of an opinion or a viewpoint. Now, I think also important in ethical veganism, which I didn't know until I read the case, was that certain aspects are rooted in Jainism, which is an Indian faith, which holds that all sentient life is sacred. Generally, all ethical vegans live according to a belief or conviction that it's wrong to exploit and kill living beings unnecessarily. And this moral conviction is cogent, serious and important. As we shall see, a day in the life of Mr. Costa is quite a serious affair. He showers with vegan friendly shampoos and soap. He shaves with an electric razor, which is powered by electricity bought from Ecotricity, which is a power supplier which has been certified as vegan. His clothes are made of synthetic fibres. He eats particular breakfast items, and takes vitamin supplements, which are produced by the Vegan Society. And I found this one very interesting. If his destination is with, within one hour's walking distance, he will walk there to avoid accidental collisions with insects or birds when taking a bus or public, public transport. And not surprisingly, my wife said, he also won't date anyone who isn't a vegan. So he's quite limited, I think, there in his lifestyle choices. In light of this, the judge found that it is easy to conclude that there was an overwhelm that there was overwhelming evidence that ethical veganism in this case was capable of being a philosophical belief because it really went to the root of his entire life. Um, it met all the requirements of the Equality and Human Rights Commission Code of Practice as well. Now, vegetarianism seems that it doesn't attract the same degree of protection, or at least it didn't in the case for Mr. Conisby, spelt C-O-N-I-S-B-E-E, -E, when he brought a claim against Crossley Farms uh, this year, although he is seeking permission to appeal. And I'll just speak very briefly about why that was found not to be a philosophical belief. Well, his vegetarianism, whilst genuine, did not have the same degree of seriousness to elevate it to a protected characteristic. It is perhaps a surprising result, given that in 2005, the House of Lords held that vegetarianism is capable, in principle at least, of amounting to a protected belief, because it's an example of the rights to freedom of thought, belief and religion under Article 9 of the Human Rights Act. But in Mr. Conisby's case, the Employment Tribunal endorsed the employer's argument that vegetarianism is not about human life and behaviour. It's a lifestyle choice, or at least it was in this case. And whilst an admirable sentiment to believe that it's wrong uh, and that to, to kill animals or that the world would be a better place if they were not killed for food, this was more of a opinion or viewpoint than something that could be described as a weighty and substantial aspect of human life and behaviour. Whilst there are many vegetarians throughout the world, the reason for being a vegetarian can differ greatly among vegetarians, unlike veganism, where the reasons appear to be largely the same. So vegetarians adopt uh, their practice for lots of different reasons, lifestyle, health, diet, concern about the way animals are reared for food and so on. But vegans simply do not accept the practice under any circumstances uh, of eating meat, fish or dairy products and have distinct concerns about the way animals are reared. So there you can see a clear cogency and cohesion in vegan belief, which appears contrary to vegetarianism. And it's also underpinned in the ethical context by this idea of Jainism. Um, so there you go. Now, remember that all cases are fact specific. And given that this is a first instance decision in the employment tribunal, in fact, both are, they're not binding. But it is indicative of the broad scope of the meaning of religion and belief under the Equality Act. Don't assume that because someone is professing a particular belief in the workplace, however seemingly irrational, uh, that it's not protected by the legislation. Sadly, I don't think my excessive consumption of sherry and Christmas pudding at Christmas will amount to a belief warranting protection, but we shall see. <laughs> So thanks for that, Meredith. Um, and hopefully now everyone can see why the uh, Veganuary poll was appropriate uh, at the start of this webinar. Um, Julie, turning to a different area um, now, but one with uh, some significant cases as well this year, um, you're going to have a look at worker status. Now, worker status has been a hot topic for a couple of years now. Um, why is it of such interest? Oh, yes, um, it is of interest because if a person is an employee, 
then they've got the full raft of employment law rights, including the right not to be unfairly dismissed. But if a person is a genuine self-employed independent contractors, um, then they've got no employment law rights as such. But we do have this middle group, workers. And whilst workers don't have the full employment law rights, they do have some rights, in particular, the right to the national minimum wage and also to holiday pay. So who are workers? Well, there's various definitions of a worker in different legislation. Uh, but probably the, the main one, which is set out in the Employment Rights Act of 1996, and which is also the same as the one in under for national minimum wage and the working time regulations, can effectively be summarised as follows. First of all, it's someone who works under an employment contract. So that sounds very much like an employee. And indeed, an employee is defined as a worker too. But you've also got uh, the other definition for a worker, which is somebody who does who performs work personally, they perform work or services personally. So if they can genuinely send a substitute, then this starts to suggest that they may be more like an independent contractor. The other criteria is that the individual um, is not a client, so the other engaging business, the other party is not a client or a customer of the individual. So this suggests that there needs to be some degree of control that's exercised by the engaging business over the individual's work. There can be other things that help to define a worker. For example, the exclusivity of the arrangement. The more exclusive it is, the more likely someone's to be a worker. If it's the engaging business that's supplying the equipment, again, things that suggest it's a worker. And the level of risk. If the level of risk by the individual is low, that helps to indicate that it's more like a, a worker. Thanks. And to put that in some sort of practical context, there's been a number of cases involving couriers and drivers this year, haven't there? Um, tell us a bit more about those. Yes, in, indeed, the two cases that um, I'm about to mention are about couriers and drivers. There's a case involving Yodel, the delivery company, and there's one involving Uber. In both of these cases, the engaging businesses, Yodel and Uber, both say that the individuals that are working under them are independent, self-employed contractors, and they give them a contract that says this. So the question becomes, are these really self-employed contractors or are they workers? So turning first of all to the Yodel case, <clears throat> and I'll provide the, the citations for, the, for this later. Um, but in April this year, the European Court of Justice considered the question of whether a yodel driver, known as B, um, was a worker under the Working Time Directive. And here, the European Court of Justice has indicated that B would not be a worker. The key points on this to note are that B uses his own vehicle and mobile phone when carrying out work for Yodel. Also, although the deliveries had to be done within a certain time window, B was able to set his own working hours and delivery routes. He could also appoint a substitute if he wanted, although he never actually did do so. It seemed that Yodel was under no obligation to provide him with work and he could reject the jobs if he wanted. And he could also go and work for a competitor um, if he so chose. So in light of all of this, I think it was quite perhaps easy, therefore, for the European Court of Justice to say that B did appear to have a great deal of latitude over how and when he did his work. And his independence from Yodel didn't appear to be fictitious. So he was regarded as a worker. Now, Turning to the Uber case, um, so far, the, um, this has recently, in July this year, went to the Supreme Court. Um, and the reason that it's gone to the Supreme Court is so far, um, all the lower courts have decided, have held, that Uber drivers are workers. But 
Uber doesn't like this decision and it has appealed to the Supreme Court. Now, the Supreme Court decision on this is awaited. However, it's probably worthwhile having a look at why, um, what the arguments were that Uber put forward and why the Court of Appeal has so far said that, or the Court of Appeal by a majority has um, said that Uber drivers are workers. Well, first of all, <clears throat> um, Uber's argument is that they're just this like, technology platform. They're this intermediary. They're just putting the customers, the passengers in contact with the drivers. And they therefore say that the driver's contract is with each passenger as an independent contractor. But the Court of Appeal has said that this is not the reality. They, the Court of Appeal has said that Uber is not working for the drivers. It's the other way around. Also, Uber really needs to maintain this pool of drivers um, that it can call upon as and when, and that's how Uber earns its profits. Um, there seems to be as well, doesn't really seem to be the reality that there is a contract between um, the driver and the passenger, because when Uber gets the um, initial inquiry to the passenger, the driver doesn't even know um, where the destination, the end destination is going to be. And the Court of Appeal here said that this was a key factor in it. It seems as well that Uber does have quite a bit of control over the drivers. If they don't answer within a certain amount of time, they can log them off. Um, so the, although there was this contract between the drivers and Uber saying that the drivers are independent contractors, the Court of Appeal considered that this amounted to a high degree of fiction. So it will be interesting to see if the Supreme Court agrees with the majority of the Court of Appeal. My bet is that it will. And I suppose if there are any takeaways from this at the moment, um, the, the key things here are that if you are hiring um, someone on a self-employed basis, um, do be careful to ensure that it is on a genuine self-employed basis. Simply saying in an employment contract um, that it is a self-employment is not going to be sufficient. Um, do have a look at the test. Generally a good place to start, I suppose, is this like sniff test. If they um, smell and look like a worker or an employee, then they probably are. But if you're not sure, then it's probably best to take legal advice because there can be implications if you do get it wrong. Thanks, Julie. And, you know, it's worth saying that the implications of getting it wrong can be thousands and thousands of pounds in back pay for holiday and all sorts of things. So it really is uh, an important area. And um, Jonathan, I think you're going to provide an update on a different area, but still relating to contractors. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I'm going to have a word about um, IR35 and the off payroll working provisions. Um, but IR35, as you may well know, is the common name given to HMRC rules about people who work as one man band uh, companies. Uh, and what they will often do is uh, pay themselves through dividends um, and, and pay less um, tax as, as a result. But of course, a lot of these people work for a long period of time for the same uh, end user, and in many ways, using the uh, you know reference back to, um, to 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 Julie's idea, they they sort of look and smell rather like employees uh, as opposed to contractors, and that's the the, the point about IR thirty five is that the HMRC will look behind the for that formal arrangement. Why is it becoming um, uh, an, um, coming back as an issue? It's, it's at is an issue all the time, but it's a particularly big issue uh, now from April 2021 because of uh, provisions which will make middle, medium sized and large companies responsible for making assessments as to whether the contractors should really be treated uh, as employee and therefore their uh, their tax uh, status uh, change. It was originally planned to come in in April 2020, but because of the um, the, the tidal wave of COVID uh, issues, uh, it was put on hold, but it looks as if it is coming back. It's already been applied to the public sector, but now it's going to be uh, the responsibility of, of, uh, of 
companies in the private sector, as I said, middle and large uh, companies. And who, who would that be? Well, if two of the following requirements apply, that the annual turnover is not more than 10.2 million, the balance sheet is not more than 5.1 million, and there are not more than 50 employees. If two of those apply, then you, uh, the, the company will be outside of those provisions. But otherwise, this huge additional responsibility will be placed upon them. There is a tool that HMRC has uh, provided for trying to make this assessment, although many people have criticised it for not really uh, being subtle enough, because these things are so uh, fact-specific. Uh, but it is a, a significant extra burden that businesses are going to have to deal with from April 2021, unless it's a last minute like it was uh, this year. Sorry, Julie. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so, Meredith, I think you're going to cover a case which is to do with workers, um, but also yes. um, sort of touches on health and safety, whistleblowing, which are, of course, issues because of COVID and, uh, you know, what we're starting to see trickle through in terms of the types of complaints that employees are making. Yes. Um, the case is that the Queen, believe it or not, um, on behalf of the Independent Workers Union of Great Britain and the Secretary of State, I've actually uh, got a, a link there to it, uh, but I'm not sure if that's any good to you in the chat. Um, but there's a link to the case. So it's actually uni uh, Independent Workers Union and uh, D DWP and others. On the 13th of November, the High Court handed down this very important judgment in which it's held that the government has failed to protect workers, particularly those in the gig economy, from unfavourable treatment if they raise health and safety concerns at work. And this is quite a surprising uh, thing when you realise that the legislation doesn't at the moment protect uh, workers. And we've learned a little bit from Julie about what worker means. At the moment, the right to complain of detriment in circumstances where you complain about health and safety at work only applies to employees in the strict sense of the word. That is someone working under a contract of employment. So this excludes agency workers, casual workers and the like. Now, the High Court has held for the Independent Workers Union, who represent largely low paid migrant workers and those in the gig economy, that the UK had failed to has failed to properly implement a European directive into domestic legislation, uh, the Employment Rights Act, designed to ensure the health and safety of all workers. Now, this has particular relevance. And I know we said we weren't going to talk about uh, COVID, but it does have particular relevance and it continues to do so um, in the current landscape, which has seen an upsurge in whistleblowing complaints arising from failures by employers to implement social distancing measures and provide adequate PPE. Between the beginning of March and May this year, the Independent Workers Union's legal department received around 150 inquiries regarding COVID-19 health and safety issues and over 50 requests for assistance, raising issues such as the lack of PPE, many couriers for delivery companies have not been provided with any PPE whatsoever, the failure to implement social distancing whilst waiting for collections inside and outside restaurants, and amazingly, I thought this one, the failure to package COVID-19 samples correctly so as to protect uh, medical couriers. There is evidence that many workers, members of the union, of which there are 5,000 in total, um, were being expected to work without PPE and were scared to come forward for fear of victimisation. And the evidence suggests that companies were reluctant or simply refusing to implement adequate safety measures. Now, Jonathan will be talking to you briefly about the B word, Brexit, and the effect of that on European legislation for the UK. But for the purposes of this case, we can assume that the decision is likely to have potential ramifications for businesses if the legislation, in this case, the Employment Rights Act, is amended to extend um, health and safety protections to workers. And once uh, the High Court has opined on something like this, it is giving a fairly strong nudge to the judiciary that um, to the legislature, sorry, that, that the legislation should be amended. Thanks, Meredith. So um, definitely 
everyone needs to be looking out for any workers in their midst and thinking about all the additional uh, riots that they've got. Um, I'm going to cover a couple of uh, small areas now. The first being the changes to written statements of employment. So changes to the requirements um, of what needs to go in contracts of employment came in on the 6th of April. But given that this coincided with most of the HR world being in a full-blown pandemic panic box, I think we can probably all be forgiven for this item not being top of our agendas. Um, now, what's important is that you know, and um, it, you know, in case it has passed you by, that new contracts being issued to existing staff in the future or to future staff, um, you have to ensure that they comply with the new requirements. Now, I'm not going to go through every single item that, that has to be included in a contract because I'm making an assumption that everything that's gone before you already have. Um, but I'm going to tell you what's new. So the first major change and this you know, again ties into workers and more protection for workers is that there's now an obligation to provide a written statement of particulars to workers, not just employees. Um, this, I think, is likely to have a really big impact because very often casual workers, you know, the person that comes in, you know, very occasionally, you, you know, call them if it looks like you're going to be having a really busy day. They are given um, contracts uh, at the outset of, of their working relationship. Um, and so that's a big change that, that these people now also need to be given uh, contracts. Also, there's not going to be any minimum service requirement to qualify um, for receiving a written statement of particulars, which is the formal name uh, for a contract, a uh, more common name. Whereas it used to be that you didn't have to give someone a written statement of particulars for one month. So again, the, the person who perhaps just comes in for a couple of weeks, um, you know, they are going to have to have a piece of paper on day one that lists certain things out. And the majority of written particulars do have to be provided in a single document on or before the date employment starts. So it becomes now a day one right. Again, previously, we had up to two months to give people um, their written particulars. And so often people started and then get the contract together and issue it to them, get it signed, you know, once they're actually in situ working. So this is a big change. They have to have it um, on or before that day, that day one. Now, the additional things that these statements now have to contain. Firstly, the days of the week the worker is required to work, whether the days and working hours may be variable. And if so, how any variation will be determined. So that's really important. Say you've got a shift worker or, or something like that. You need to be saying, you know, we will tell you two weeks in advance which days you're working you know, in two weeks time or something like that. So you need to set out how the arrangements for that variation uh, actually work in practice. Also need to, to include any paid leave to which the work is entitled. And typically people just insert holiday and sickness, but there's all sorts of other paid leave, maternity, paternity, and um, you, know, you may offer other things that needs to go in there as well. Details of any other benefits provided by the employer that haven't already been in before. So all benefits now need to go in that agreement. Um, it's also now a requirement that probationary periods are <coughs> in that written statement of terms, including any conditions attaching to the probationary period and how long it's going to last for. And then finally, tra any training entitlement provided by the employer, including whether that training is mandatory and um, and whether it has to be paid for by the worker, that needs to go in that statement of terms as well. Um, particulars relating to incapacity, sick pay, paid leave, pensions, and non-compulsory training can be put in another reasonably accessible document, for example, a handbook, um, but they still have to be referred to in the principal statement itself. Now, in terms of consequences, what happens if you don't comply with this? Um, well, it's it's a little bit toothless in my view um, because an employee can make a complaint to an employment tribunal to say that either they haven't been given a statement or it's inaccurate or incomplete. Um, but where they haven't got another claim sitting alongside it, 
all the tribunal can do is either confirm the particulars or amend them as they think appropriate by way of a declaration. But where an employee has got another claim, say some unpaid wages or you know discrimination claim, something else, if the employer is still in breach um, of their Section 1 duties at the time of that claim going forward, the employee's eligible for a, an award of between two and four weeks pay, although it's worth saying that is subject to the statutory cap, which is currently £538 a week. So, um, you know, although it's important and it, I think it's always in the best interest to have some a written contract there, in fact, I would say that the deterrent isn't really as, as great as it should be. So that's the, the contract changes. Um, on a different top topic, um, holiday pay reference period also changed. So again, this came in the midst of COVID, so it, it may have passed you know, some employers by. But the reference period for determining an average week's pay has changed from 12 weeks to 52 weeks um, for certain categories of workers. So the new 52 week reference period will apply to all calculations of statutory holiday pay under the working time regulations in which the 12 week reference period otherwise would have been used. So in other words, we're really talking about either workers with no normal working hours or workers with normal working hours, but whose pay varies depending on the amount of work done or the time um, or days on which it's done. Um, and what this is seeking to ensure is that workers who don't have a regular working pattern throughout the year aren't disadvantaged by having to take their holiday at a time um, of the year when their weekly pay might be lower. And actually, I think with with COVID and people having been furloughed and on low pay, etc., this will actually work out um, you know, advantageously for some people who perhaps have been asked to take holiday um, whilst on furlough, for example, uh, during the, the sort of past six, eight months. Um, so those are the, the two areas that I wanted to, to cover. Um, and that's enough of me talking. Um, Jonathan, you're going to, to speak a little bit about Brexit and what the implications of that are. But can I just give everyone a reminder? Please do send in some questions um, because we're we're sort of almost at an end of the topics we're going to cover. So please do pop some questions in the chat box so that we can deal with those for you. Yeah, thanks very much, Andy. Well, Angie, um, so yes, we've been talking about the C word uh, for virtually a whole year and now, as Meredith says, we've got to talk about the dreaded B word and it's going to be with us um, from January uh, of this uh, year. And how's it going to affect employment law? Well, uh, the, the, um, during this year, although we've been outside during the transition period, it's as if we've been inside the uh, EU. And what's going to happen on the, uh, the day we f leave uh, fully is that there's going to be a snapshot of the law. So the law, law will, be, will remain in place, including all European law and so on. But, of course, we will be much freer to change it. I should mention that there was a, an important change affecting employment law in the European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act of uh, 2020, because previously the, there had been some protection, a provision for protection of, um, of workers' rights, uh, but that's not in there. So the government is giving itself a fairly free hand. And if you think about the range of law that, that comes uh, in a part or in whole from Europe, um, it gives you an idea of how much we could see the law change. Quite a few areas of discrimination law, of course, equality and human rights law, uh, family friendly law, uh, the transfer of undertakings or TUPI, um, holidays um, and working time and collective redundancy, um, the agency workers regulations, data protection, of course, uh, as well as posted uh, workers. Uh, so all of those things will be up for grabs. Now, it's a political matter, of course, how the law changes, but it's also going to be a judicial uh, matter. Now, retained EU, EU law will, will still be there, but the interpretation of it uh, will evolve. Uh, they will take into account, the judiciary will take into account um, cases decided in Europe, but they won't be bound in the same way. 
uh, and you'll also see initially both the Supreme Court um, uh, the highest court in, in Scotland being uh, permitted to, uh, to, 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 to vary um, uh, the, the law. And it's possible that um, the, the, the government will decide to extend the um, to uh, extend this down the judiciary so that we will see interpretation of things even if they're in origin European law in uh, a way which is quite uh, distinct. So it is very much uh, a case of watch uh, this space. Thanks, Jonathan. So has anyone got any questions to, um, to, to kick us off with? No, it looks like we've done an absolutely, you know, fantastic job of giving everyone, making everyone completely up to date. Um, I see there's one question here, Angie. Um, uh, uh, somebody um, uh, is, is asking, we have many benefits um, which are included in the handbook um, and whether or not they um, have to be, uh, they're of a contractual nature. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it, the sort of detail can still go in the handbook rather than, you know, have pages of it on the employment contract. But I think what's important is that the contract says you know, there is this benefit that you get uh, you know, and the full details can be somewhere else but you need to sort of mention the benefit itself rather than just say nothing about it in the contract and you know it, it's somewhere else so that's um that's sort of the the important part that it the, the actual benefit itself is stated but the detail can be elsewhere you know and subject to change because sometimes policies uh you know and, and benefits and uh, the sort of detail around these things can change from time to time. Um, right, we've got some other ones in now, so that's good. So we've got about 10 employees doing secretarial duties. We need to make a couple of them redundant and we would like to select the poor performers. Can we do this without putting them all at risk? Um, well, I'm happy to take that because I've just uh, sort of had a similar redundant exercise with a client. Um, at, and people do take different approaches and there's not necessarily anything wrong in how they in how they do that um, generally um, what, what is expected to be seen is that everyone gets scored say there's 10 and you need to, to, to remove two if you score if you sort of set the selection criteria set it objectively fairly etc and then you score everyone you can then see who the two bottom scorers are and so what um, I would generally do to avoid everyone being, you know, distressed, etc., is to then just go ahead with initial meetings with those two people and, um, ex and then you'll start the whole consultation press and you'll obviously have, you know, several meetings with those people and you'll explain the criteria and then you'll explain their scoring and you'll give them an opportunity to comment on all of that. Um, and of course, in, in a genuine redundancy process, if there's only a, a mark in it and someone comes up with a really valid point during that exercise, it could be that they then go up into the safe zone and someone else drops down um, and, and then becomes one of the bottom two scorers. So what you can't do is give everyone else an absolute assurance. So what clients tend to do is to say to everyone, just to let you know that they're, we are making a, a couple of redundancies, if you're if you're you know you're not currently affected by those um, you know anyone that is affected will will be told by the end of the day for example so you know the whole team's not worrying endlessly over it. Um, if you want sort of specific advice on the step by step you know, checklist of how to go through that, you know more than happy to do that with you. But absolutely, it's possible to do it without uh, you know putting everyone at risk and affecting. Everyone. Uh, next question, on IR35, are there any circumstances that HMRC can come after contractors for uh, Yes, well, IR35 is already in place. Um, it's been in place for a number of years uh, now. And it, the, 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 uh, there are contractors who from time to time get pulled up um, by the by HMRC or um, their um, 
the, the, the their intermediary company. Uh, and so, yes, HMRC um, can come after contractors. What's actually changing is that with larger private sector um, companies, the HMRC is passing the responsibility to them for making that determination, whereas at the moment it, it, it lies with um, the contractual and their intermediary uh, company. So yes, and, and, and I'm, you know, from time to time, um, HMRC has um, pursued contractors for quite um, a large amount of arrears of tax. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Okay. Um, just to go back on the redundancy question about agreeing the criteria, shouldn't you do that with staff reps before starting consultation? Well, if you've only got two, you wouldn't necessarily have staff representatives. It obviously depends on the setup you've got in your organisation. Um, and again, providing you, you do end up consulting on that aspect and take it into account um, and, and sort of roll her ahead if some you know good points are made then it's not necessarily going to be fatal to it, but the, all things that get weighed up along, along the way, the, the desire to do that versus the desire to put 10 people uh, at risk. And as I said, there's not a set procedure, but um, it, you know, what, what we generally do is sit down with the client, consider everything and then agree the best way, but in, in a way that's going to be a fair way um, at the end of the day. Um, another question, is uh, at what point these days in someone's employment do all the important rights kick in, um, like claim unfair dismissal, et cetera? And I think Meredith, um, you'd sort of done a reply to that, but probably it's not a public one. So do you want to sort of explain a bit about when different rights kick in? Yeah, sure. Um, ordinary unfair dismissal, what we deal with in terms of misconduct, capability, um, redundancy, that sort of thing, uh, the re qualifying period is two years. There are what we call automatically unfair reasons, for example, raising a health and safety concern, making a protected disclosure, um, commonly called whistleblowing, and various other reasons related to maternity and things like that, where no qualifying period is required. But the burden of proof is on the individual to establish the reason. And in, in discrimination cases, of course, there's no qualifying period. So race, sex, disability, etc. cetera, um, there is no... Um, there is no qualifying period whatsoever for, for those. So two years for your ordinary, what we might call bog standard unfair dismissal, uh, but a lot of other things don't have any qualifying period at all. Yeah. And it's like wages as well. Uh, you know, of course, if you're owed money or you're owed holiday pay or that sort of thing, you, know, you can bring that at any point. I think um, the... Uh you know, what we're seeing, I mean, a big risk area at the moment is a lot of employers who, with people who don't have two years, and perhaps the people who are saying, I'm not coming to work because of COVID or, you know, it's, it's not safe for me to come into the office, etc. cetera. Um, that is a big risk area because they could fairly easily turn that into a health and safety dismissal, which doesn't have a qualifying period. So, um, so yeah, you really do have to be careful in checking. There's no none of the exceptions apply um, to this mm. situation here. So that really is a uh, sort of important. Um, right, let's have a look at any other questions. Um, Thank you. I think there's one about um, <clears throat> the worker status as well. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, Oh, I, I'm still a bit fuzzy about the worker status. Well, I think we all are. Um, <laughs> I don't think anyone ever get. you know, you, as, as, um, both Julie and Jonathan have said, there's that, the smell test, and you get a feel for it. But beyond that, it's, there's not much concrete, but maybe you can try and give some gems of wisdom, Julie. Yeah, so what I was going to say is that, you know, maybe uh, like as an example, um, a plumber that comes to your house to do some personal work, they're more likely, you know, they're likely to be regarded as a genuine self-employed person. They're going to be able to, for example, you know, send a substitute and things like that. But it, 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 is, it is a bit of a fuzzy area between, um, you know, the, the employee, what this middle ground of worker and a self-employed person. I think it's probably easier to distinguish between an employee and a self-genuine self-employed person 
um, in the sense that you've got the employees under the employment contract, as I say, you've got a genuine self-employed person who really can come, come and go as they want. You really haven't got a great deal of control over exactly what they're doing, uh, but I'm more than happy to give some more details to uh, to anyone um, afterwards. Yeah. And what, what, one of the um, significant points is mu what we call mutuality of obligation. Um, and you'll find that there was a worker case a few years ago called Windle, where um, it was found that even that there would have to be mutuality between assignments, for, even for there to be a worker status. But that, I'm not sure if that's still good law. But mutuality is talking about the obligation on the organisation to provide work. And if offered the obligation on the on the individual to accept work. So you can't say, you know, I don't feel like coming in today. Well, you can. But if you're an employee, you might have a problem there. Um, but is this requirement to, if given work, to do it? Uh, and, and that's, you know, one of the tenets of employment. But as Julie says, there's a whole shopping list of factors that we look at and the courts get it wrong all the time. Uh, so you can see that our jobs can be quite difficult at times as well. Yeah, I mean, it, the very fact that you end up going through, you know, the employment tribunal, employment appeal tribunal, the high court, court of appeal, Supreme Court, who disagree shows that you know all of us will have a, an opinion on it and so, you know even the judges do not share the same opinion and you know that's i guess that's what's make our jobs interesting most of the time um one final quick question um about ir35 so jonathan um, we've got a not-for-profit entity that's a separate business. Given they themselves would fall outside the qualifying number of employees, could they be outside of the provisions? Um, okay, I'm not quite. I mean, the 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 the, the details of the setup would be quite important um, uh, for this. But I, I guess if you're if you're talking about, I mean, IR35 is where we've got a contractor, an an individual who could be identified. Uh, as really an employee so if there's more than one then it, it's it's um it's not so likely to be be um an issue uh, i mean there isn't also a question uh, i mean and again it's, it's it is quite a com uh, complicated area but there's also a question of different responsibilities for different people in the chain where you have um agency an agency above the um the one man band ent entity and and there are going to be some responsibilities uh, for them to pass on um any, any determination and pass it pass information on to the the large company client and any determination by that um larger organization down to the uh, the one man band uh, uh contractor uh, company um so that uh uh, the appropriate determination um, is, is applied in terms of how tax is dealt with. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, right, I'm going to start a final poll now. Perhaps while people are answering this poll, uh, Meredith, could you just go over for our final question what protection whistleblowers have got? I mean, obviously, it's only if uh, you know the employer subjects them to some sort of detriment that they have. There's yeah, sure. The final poll before you start is... Who's looking forward to a few days off over Christmas um, out of the HR community? So what the, what the result of that is, OK, go away, Meredith. OK, I'm on the spot here. I better go and get a brandy so I can remember. <laughs> um, so, I mean, whistleblowing is a protection for um, individuals. It covers not only employees, but workers in a broader sense um, who uh, bring to their employer's attention some form of uh, breach of, an, of a legal enactment. Um, so in the COVID context, it could be, as we've said, the failure to provide PPE. They have to bring that complaint to um, a specified person within their organisation. They have to hold a reasonable belief um, in the information. And fundamentally, the item that they're bringing or the information that they're bringing to their employer has to be in the public interest. Um, and they have to disclose information. They can't just make a general allegation, such as um, there was a case where a chap, the wards aren't uh, safe because there are sharps lying around and uh, uh, you know, dirty items on the floor. That would be the, the imparting of information. Now, if somebody blows the whistle and you then subject them to a detriment to silence them, that will give rise to a potential claim. And there's no qualifying period and no cap on the compensation. So a reminder of one of the more scary areas of the law. 
Thanks for that, Meredith. Now, surprisingly, this poll, 78% are looking forward to a few days off over Christmas, and 21%, strangely, they don't be silly. I can't imagine <laughs> looking forward to a break. Um, but thanks, guys, for that roundup. Um, I think we've done our best to answer as many questions as possible. If you've got any further questions, please do get in touch. Um, please take advantage of our free one hour consultation offer, um, and we'll set up a, a consultation in the new year to have a chat about, you know, just any issues that you might have on your mind. Um, can I thank you all for tuning in throughout the year? Um, our schedule for 2021 is now on the website um, and we're kicking off 2021 with a useful look at pitfalls in disciplinary procedures. Um, this year has truly been exceptional and I think I can say with absolute certainty that alongside the healthcare and the frontline workers, uh, HR professionals aren't that far behind in terms of deserving a break at the end of this year. Um, it's, it's been quite a, a crazy year and we at Thomas Mansfield hope that you're able to get a break, recharge your batteries and, and come back to 2021, which I'm sure is going to be another busy one. So I'll say goodbye and see you next year, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye.